Okay, I'll um, call this workshop to order. Um, in accordance with the town's procedural bylaw, no decisions are to be made, but rather this meeting is an opportunity for council to have informal discussions regarding various matters. In this case, we're looking at the opportunities for redevelopment on Davis Drive. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Okay, there being none, what I would like to do is uh, uh, introduce some members from our Economic Development Advisory Committee and members of the Chamber of Commerce. I see that uh, Deborah Scott is here as a representative of the Chamber of Commerce and members of the Economic Development Advisory Committee. We've got uh, Paul Montador, Donna Favreau, Peter Mertens, Eric Farmer, Jim Grotmans, and Gary Ryan. Did I miss anybody? So thank you for taking the time to uh, come out and, and, and hear about this. Uh, and I hope you'll find this is an, as informative as we expect it to be. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Shelton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just very briefly to, uh, to kick things off, I'll set out uh, what the morning's going to look like. So there are really three components to the uh, presentation in the workshop and we want to make sure that it's not just a presentation, that uh, there are questions and, and this is uh, Council's opportunity to really probe in terms of um, you know, how do we get intensification to take place in our corridors. So the morning's going to break down into three parts as I mentioned. First one is uh, town staff through our director of uh, uh, building and planning, uh, setting out the why, you know, why we need this in the town of Newmarket on the, in the centres and corridors uh, area. Then we're going to go to an industry expert and Rick will introduce um, Mark Conway from Barry Lyon. And then the third component is uh, back to staff to set out um, our current thinking in terms of a process for marketing the corridors. And I'll just stress again, please, um, take advantage of the fact that we do have an industry expert with us here to uh, determine what we need to do to, to make sure that we continue to, uh, to grow and prosper in the town of Newmarket. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Rick. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> and to be clear, I'm not the industry expert. Mark and Matt are. <laughs> what do I got to do here, Linda? To Yeah, not this. <laughs> just a slide. Slide show. This is not supposed to rank with its face there. Perfect. Thanks very much. And um, I guess, so as Bob mentioned, I'm going to uh, just mention a little bit about the why. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, why are we marketing the corridors uh, and in particular I guess the question of why we're marketing corridors equals why do we hope to intensify uh, within the town of Newmarket and as you can see on the slide there are really four main reasons that we're talking about in terms of why it's appropriate to think about some intensification on Young and on Davis Drive the first being uh, some pretty significant planning policy um, certainly, um, uh, council strategic priorities that have been previously set uh, speak to it, as well as uh, other factors such as Viva, and that last one that talks about healthy and complete communities, and we'll chat a little bit about that in a moment. Um, in terms of the planning policy, there is policy direction at the provincial, regional, and town level that not only supports but also requires the kind of development uh, that we're planning um, for the quarters in Newmarket. Uh, to begin with, you've got the uh, Provincial Policy Statement or the PPS, uh, and at the highest level it pro uh, provides direction to municipalities in how and where they should grow. Um, it promotes efficient development patterns that support mix of housing, employment, recreation, and parks and open space as well as transportation choices that increase the use of active transportation uh, and transit before other modes of uh, travel are, are given the priority. Um, places to grow, so it's, it's one step down. It's also a provincial document, as you know, and it takes that PPS vision and establishes a land use and transportation vision for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Um, 
in the growth plan new market has been identified as one of 25 urban growth centers in the in the greater golden horseshoe and these are all areas that are designed to accommodate a significant share of population and employment growth in the future uh, there are areas of high density and major employment uses um, they've there are going to be focus areas for commercial, recreation, cultural, and entertainment activities, um, and accommodation uh, and support of major transit infrastructure. Um, and within these designated areas, um, there are tar uh, minimum targets uh, for employment and uh, population of 200 people and jobs per net hectare. And so in Newmarket's case, the, the area that's centered on Young and Davis down to uh, um, just uh, north of Eagle is our urban growth center. Um, the regional official plan um, at the regional level, Newmarket is one of, as you know, the four urban centers in the region along with Markham, Vaughan, and Richmond Hill uh, that is designated as, uh, as a, a regional urban center. And the policies in the regional OP really uh, mirror a lot of those of the provincial growth plan. Uh, these are the most intensive areas for concentration of development, the greatest mix of uses um, within the region, vibrant urban spaces for living, working, shopping, entertainment, and culture, as well as a range of employment and housing-oriented uh, activities to, uh, toward the rapid transit hubs. Um, and the regional OP also has uh, minimum intensification targets itself and they're expressed as a um, uh, floor space index of 2.5 uh, at a minimum. And uh, lastly, in terms of uh, the new market planning documents uh, is the need to accommodate those growth targets coupled with the fact that we, there's a general lack of greenfield opportunities within new market uh, in order to do so. So the back, as far back as in 2006, our official plan uh, th set the stage for uh, urban development along our corridors, and you'll recall it contemplated a two-phased approach where the highest <laughs> densities were going to concentrate along the areas of, of the development of the future Viva system, uh, and also that's when we would do the secondary plan, so we're now fully into that second phase of that exercise. Uh, so our secondary plan is in a direct response to the PPS, the growth plan, the regional OP, and it reflects this council's interpretation of those documents in terms of uh, how it sees itself going forward. And again, just the, uh, the, the targets that we're aiming for is 33,000 people uh, and 32,000 jobs by what we're calling build out, which is uh, 2051, uh, more or less. So. The other uh, pillar of these um, uh, policy frameworks are Council's uh, strategic priorities, and um, Susan Chase uh, will be uh, spending some time on these, but it's worthwhile to note that certainly four out of the five primary uh, policy frameworks are all being addressed by the, uh, the notion of uh, uh, selling the corridors. As you see there, certainly the one that's uh, governing uh, economic development and jobs, being supportive of Viva Next, preparing a redevelopment strategy and implementing the secondary plan um, are, are very key to this exercise, as is uh, below it community engagement um, and how we engage our community to see that happen. Um, certainly traffic safety and mitigation, it's not always just about stop signs in residential areas, it's also about broadly in, uh, improving traffic congestion, uh, supporting major transit service enhancements, uh, as well as uh, supporting the development of the mobility hubs. And then ultimately, uh, certainly these things would lead toward uh, efficiency and financial management and how we provide service delivery to the community. <coughs> Excuse me. So the last, or the, uh, the next one that I wanted to mention is the Viva project, and I, uh, I know I'm sort of singing to the choir a little bit, we, we understand the significance of it. Um, but frankly, the development of the urban centers as, as they're contemplated in all those planning documents I mentioned can really only happen in concert with this higher order transit system. Um, it certainly applies from a, a people moving and traffic management perspective. However, it also applies on a much broader scale because it isn't just about moving people and things, but it's also about how we go about creating communities. Uh, rapid transit in this instance can help shape communities and acts as a catalyst, or we hope it will, uh, to stimulate the development contemplated uh, in the secondary plan. 
the, um, the, the last uh, item that I wanted to speak about is healthy and complete communities. And uh, um, what you're seeing there is the covering page of a document that was done by OPPI, the Ontario Professional Planners Institute, back in 07, um, which uh, spoke to um, matching the links between land use planning and public health. Um, and uh, this, this paper uh, recognized that good urban form is functional, economically and environmentally sustainable and livable, all in a way that promotes public health. And um, I mean, you know, you see some of the factors there that uh, as we move away from sort of a, a sprawling, car dependent kind of uh, a lifestyle to one that is uh, more encouraging of uh, walking or cycling uh, and uh, not relying solely on the car, that uh, we might be able to move toward uh, the satisfaction of some of those factors that you see there. And uh, so I had mentioned good urban form and what is good urban form? And I guess we can talk about uh, the fact that compact communities are defined by centers, nodes, and multinodal corridors uh, with a variety of houses, housing options. They're walkable, <clears throat> they're cyclable and transit supportive. Uh, they're safe and accessible and they promote a sense of place and you know you're seeing a graphic there that talks about the old way of doing things where there isn't much interaction amongst the community uh, with the and no we're not bringing the subway to Newmarket yet but on the, the lower slide you see the kind of urban development this is one of the slides that was created uh, by the region in aid of um, some of the work being done in Markham a number of years ago so in a nutshell this is what we're uh, what we're hoping to see take place ultimately along uh, our corridors in Newmarket and uh, why some of these initiatives are are being directed toward that so um, in conclusion we're trying to see if we can market Young and Davis as a mixed-use high-density corridor um, there's planning policy at the town regional and provincial level that not only encourages it but mandates it <clears throat> it has been identified as a specific strategic council's uh, priority, excuse me, priority, and it supports the investment in transit, and it supports healthy, complete communities. So with that, I'm going to uh, invite Mark Conway up in a moment, and just for those of you who are not familiar with uh, his firm, Enberry Lyons Consultants, um, is a multidisciplinary uh, re real estate consulting firm and they're uh, involved in all aspects of uh, land development including urban planning, land economics, market analysis, financial analysis and a number of other different factors. Um, essentially they have their finger on the pulse of land development in the GTA. And Mark Conway has been with the firm for a number of years. He's a professional planner and a land economist and he as I mentioned is the senior uh, partner for the firm. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Maybe before we do that, um, I see our Councillor Hampton um, wanted to do questions and clarification <coughs> to Mr. Nethery, and then we'll move on to the presentation from Barry Lyons. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation, Rick. We've seen this many times, and it's always helpful and informative. Uh, my question is regarding uh, transit. Um, Newmarket really does need a, a transit hub. Other municipalities have transit hubs where you have the GO train going to one location, the um, bus lines going to the same, or Viva going to the same area, Metrolinx, and YRT and having one transit hub where transit users can, because, you know, sometimes you can get the train to one location, then you have to jump on a bus to take the, bu take the bus if you park your car, and it's just very inconvenient. Um, and we, as Newmarket, really need a transit hub, one-stop shop for transit users. And I was wondering where the, if, if you could tell me where the region and the, and the province is on creating a transit hub for Newmarket and what we as a town are doing to encourage this type of uh, a hub in our community, which is much needed. Sure. Through you, Mr. Mr. Mayor, the, mm -hmm. um, uh, we have uh, actually language within the secondary plan that makes reference to a mobility hub, which I think is pretty much the same uh, thing that we're uh, referring to. We have received a commitment out of Metrolinx to participate in that uh, by way of um, financial resources along with the region. Um, and so, so that's something that is, uh, is on, on the work program. Uh, and we haven't yet begun that because we've been kind of 
busy doing some other things right now to, to see where we are in terms of getting the secondary plan through, but that is one of the very next steps that would be taking place. Mm -hmm. And so the good news is we have received the uh, commitment from those other parties to, uh, to help us do that. Now, I, I know in the uh, regional master plan, um, their transit <coughs> master plan, they identify a location along um, for, for a go along uh, Mulock um, in their master plan. Um, and I, I think that would be a great, great spot for a, a train station and, and the bus station as well, and that transit or mobility hub. Um, we have many level crossings in, in the town of Newmarket, and that could uh, help with dealing with, you know, future traffic along those level crossings. So have there been any discussions on, with the region on purchasing and acquiring property um, on Mule Lock along that uh, railway line? Uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, none that I'm specifically aware of. Um, the uh, the region has, um, through time, identified a uh, a potential station um, as part of their overall transportation planning network at that general location without, you know, identifying a specific location. And we've done the same in terms of our official plan to identify that general area. Um, but in terms of actually acquiring or having conversations with it, with the um, individual property owners, I'm not aware of that. Um, ultimately, if it were a, um, a, a Metrolink station, it would probably be the province that would be uh, having those conversations in any event about an acquiring Mr. land. Mr. Sheldon, add to that. If I could just uh, add to that, Mr. Mayor, a couple of points. Uh, one, there have been high level discussions in terms of opportunities for um, preparing for the future in that area of the railway tracks in Mulock. Um, being a property issue, it might be best talked about in uh, closed session, but there have been high level discussions in that regard and they do continue. Um, the uh, second point is there is a working group um, across the region and I think beyond and our Commissioner of uh, Infrastructure Services is part of that group. So they are looking at um, uh, there are discussions on pretty well all of the aspects associated with GO, including the electrification. And Peter, I don't know if you'd like to add anything further to that. Mr. Nohammer? Yep. Thank you, Bob, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as the CEO has indicated, uh, through YRTC and uh, the region's uh, Transportation Commission, um, the local nine municipalities and the region have been um, holding meetings uh, collectively and inviting Metrolink staff to uh, help provide further information on future plans for the regional express rail program, uh, which will include an investigation not only of the existing stations and upgrades, um, but uh, the identification of potential new stations. And uh, they're looking at that with the eye of increasing accessibility to the new service, increased frequency service, but also um, keeping in mind that uh, if you add more stations at more frequent stops, uh, the overall travel time begins to degrade for people taking it from one end to the other. So they're looking at it uh, in a balanced view. Um, I can tell you that they are looking at uh, a station on Mulock. Um, the, prop, the exact location of that station is still to be determined, but uh, as our directors indicated, it has been identified not only in the regions but our own official plan, um, and uh, it is being looked at seriously. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And any advocacy that we can do on uh, municipal end is very helpful um, for having uh, people locate along our corridors and having the density that we do need and we want to see happen. Uh, transit is very important and that hub is an important component of that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, how far are we on the hub study? Because I, I thought that was going to be done this year, early next year. Peter, what kind of progress are we making on the, the tannery site? I think that's the initial hub study and it'll expand from there. Yeah. Well, with, uh, as you can appreciate with the number of um, uh, projects underway uh, on the Regional Express Rail, the hub study is, it hasn't started yet. It's uh, due to start uh, sometime in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, we do hope to get a better idea in terms of schedule uh, from Metrolinks. Um, in fact, a Metrolinks representative will be before our Committee of the Whole uh, at uh, an upcoming meeting in November, um, and that might be a good opportunity to uh, discuss it there. But um, we, we do hope that it will get started in 2016. Good. Thank you. Regional Councillor. Uh, yeah, I just want to add that, and I think uh, 
um, leave it to the mayor to, to make uh, comments himself uh, if you choose. But I just want to say, because I, I think it's important that it's clear. Um, uh, 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 Councillor uh, Hempen, that uh, there has the issue of, uh, of you know examining and uh, potentially protecting for land and, on New Lock. I, you know, as one person, have raised probably at four or five different meetings um, that were uh, you know related to the corridor or at the region or elsewhere, um, and involving the most senior uh, MetroLinx people, other MetroLinx people, the minister himself. And so <clears throat> definitely raising, the, as you pointed out, the need to just sort of continually be, uh, be stressing this issue so uh, we don't uh, fall to the very bottom of the list in sort of uh, in terms of attention or thought being given to this. But as uh, the commissioner pointed out there, there's a process that they're putting in place to, to study uh, any new locations and, and they'll uh, evaluate them according to sets of criteria, but just the same, it's important to, to keep uh, having that discussion. So um, I, I've raised it many times and will continue to do so. Thank you. Okay, let's go forward with the next presentation. Thanks, Richard. Your Worship, Mayor, uh, members of Council, uh, Mr. Nethery forgot to mention my most uh, important credential was that I was I broke into this career as an intern to Mr. Nethery at the Township of uh, Georgina. So, I, so my background uh, begins with uh, Richard, and um, um, and thanks for uh, just, uh, introducing our firm. We've been in business for 40 years in this uh, country. Most of uh, our work is in the major centers, Vancouver, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, and mostly it's for private developers. Mostly what I do is where a, de a developer will come to us with a piece of land and they'll say, what can we do with this property? And largely this is, uh, most of our business has been in the high density sector. And, uh, and our clients are both big and, big and small. The big clients come to us primarily just as a reality check. Sometimes they fall in love with a piece of real estate and they come to us and say, you know, are we, are we a bit myopic about this? Give us another opinion. In other cases, it's just mom and pops that have a piece of land and really aren't sure how to move forward. So we get the big and the small. So today I'm just gonna walk through how we look at the new market uh, market from the perspective of high density residential ownership development, not rental development. I'm going to start with some very high-level statistics, and then I'm going to work into some of the details and how a developer might look at a piece of land, both from a market perspective and from an economic perspective. So the first stat is I'm sure you're all well aware of, the vast majority <coughs> of high-density development happens in the city of Toronto, about 74%. That's changing, but it's still likely to be uh, the major driver and location of high-density development to, uh, in the next few years. Uh, and there's uh, York Region above, you, above Toronto at 14%, Durham gets very little, uh, uh, Mississauga 6%, and uh, increasingly more in Halton Region. And here's York Region, clearly all the southern municipalities are grabbing a little bit more, a little bit because of uh, the Spadina subway extension to the Vaughan Metropolitan Centre, uh, Markham's getting a fair bit of course at 42%. And, and what's, uh, again, no surprise to you is the um, uh, town of Newmarket has, hasn't captured much demand in the last five years. In fact, we, we, we haven't seen any new projects launched uh, recently. But why is that? Well, the pattern of sales activity just starts to tell you, I mean, that big circle in downtown Toronto, it's all about, right now, it's all about the city of Toronto. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's driving this market. I'm going to use Toronto as a comparison. I'm not saying that Toronto is competitive to new market. It's not, but it's a really useful way to identify the market differences because they're so extreme. But generally, when we look for at high density development, these are the things that that we look for. And affordability, bar none, is the number one reason driving high density development. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in the city of Hamilton, New Market, or downtown Toronto, people shift to high density development because it's generally more affordable. 
But there's also a lot of other factors, demographic and cultural shifts. So seniors, again, are driving the need for new high density development. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But also millennials. Was the big issue in the city of Toronto right now are the millennials who are now turning 35 years of age. They're starting to form households. And they've been the people that have been living in rental housing. Typically, those buyers would, uh, by the time they got into their early 30s, they'd start into ownership. They might move to the suburbs. They might move to Hyde Park, they might buy a townhouse in uh, Riverdale, but those choices are now becoming unaffordable for those people. So those are becoming even a greater driver of uh, high density development. The other very, very high de uh, driver of uh, high density development is uh, investors. And these are the investors that are taking advantage of the lack of quality rental uh, product in the market. So they've, they've been doing uh, uh, really smart things in terms of investment and uh, filling a gap and again I'll talk about that in a little bit more. The other piece, big piece, is just about quality of life and Rick pointed out to that, that, pe that this fact that people are now starting to look for more walkable communities and great neighborhoods so if you can't afford a big house in Rosedale you might be able to afford uh, a condo nearby. Maintenance-free living is becoming a, a very big driver, especially for seniors and young people. Access to transit, very, very large driver of high-density demand, especially when transit is high order. When I say high order, I mean subway, high frequency, uh, low cost, and very reliable. Security is another driver of high-density development. People want to know that uh, uh, they're safe in urban environments. And in downtown Toronto in particular, proximity to employment opportunities. We've had over 200 floors of new office development in the last five years that has an impact on where people make housing decisions to locate. And there's really, there's really four major buyer groups. And they, you can argue about what, there's subgroups of these, but really we look at them in four ways. There's the first time buyers, and that can be typically that's someone from 25 to 35 years of age. Uh, empty nesters, these are people that are, um, uh, their kids are moving out, and they're looking, for, looking to downsize. Seniors and retirees, that's the next level up. And then the investor group that I talked about before. So let's just take a look at these groups, because it's important to understand these groups to get a sense about the market. So here's your typical first time buyer. Affordability is the most important driver. That low monthly payment is incredibly important. They're looking for walkable uh, places where they can get to jobs and entertainment without the need for a car. It's really interesting, the car ownership issue with, um, with new buyers, even most buyers, is becoming less and less of a driver. They value access uh, over ownership. So car share is becoming very, very popular in the city of Toronto, and we see that trickling out into the 905 regions as well. And that has an impact on the economics of development. Empty nesters, the next biggest group. <clears throat> These are couples selling large family homes. They're trying to simplify their uh, life. They're still working, or they're <coughs> consulting, or they're doing working part time. They're clearly trying to get out of cutting that big lawn and fixing the huge roof. But they're also interested in larger suites. They want they want condos that have a sense of prestige and exclusivity. So they've had a really nice house in the burbs. They like the character and the prestige that house has given them. They don't, want to, they don't want their friends or family thinking they've taken a step backwards. And so having a big suite and a nice looking building uh, is very important to them. Design becomes a critical. And a problem with these, with these buyers, and this will be important to a place like Newmarket, is they take their time in buying decisions. They're not like investors where they'll make a decision in 10 seconds. They'll take days, months, weeks, whatever. And that uh, gives uh, developers lots of grief. <coughs> and retirees, that next level up, again, affordability <coughs> is important to that, uh, this group. There are, uh, could be on fixed incomes or pensions. Maintenance-free is huge. Security becomes a bigger issue. They want to know they have access to health care. They want to know that they're protected. They don't want to worry about uh, uh, their environment in the same way. They're also looking to lock and leave. They want to lock their unit, go away, and not worry about their apartment. Uh, while they spend their time in Florida or elsewhere. 
but they're also uh, very concerned about connect, keeping their social connections as well as their connections to the local pharmacy, their doctor, uh, family, and, um, and uh, that's, uh, and the final point there is we see a lot of re retirees shifting out of, uh, of the ownership market into the rental market just for a lot of those reasons. And again, investors, uh, again, this is a group that is capitalizing on just virtually no rental housing being constructed anywhere in the GTA. There's about 300,000 units of rental housing uh, in the GTA right now. Most of that's been built prior to 1991, a little bit after that, or excuse me, 19, 1971. Everything prior to 1991 is rent controlled. So we've got this uh, stock of housing that is getting very old, very fast, and uh, condo uh, investors have come in to uh, take advantage of that situation. And now they're providing condo style uh, uh, rental suites uh, that uh, have great amenities and, uh, and traditional renters are flocking to them. This is also being driven by foreign and domestic investors. There's a, one of the images is an ad that uh, one of my staff members brought back from Hong Kong last week. That's uh, Ani Development uh, promoting <coughs> a development in the Fort York community. Uh, and uh, in that ad, they're guaranteeing a 10% 10 10 return on investment, which is, of course, illegal in Canada, but they don't seem to shy away from that when you're offshore. Another big driver of investors uh, is student housing, the lack of student housing at most of our post-secondary uh, uh, institutions is uh, driving great demand for there, and that's what a lot of the demand has been the last two years in the city of Toronto. And of course, these are all very small units. So why is Toronto getting all of this demand? Well, affordability. We always look at the townhouse. The townhouse is sort of, it's always been, used to be the entry level place where, people, where young people would get into the market. Well now, the average price of a townhouse in Toronto is just under $700,000. That's not affordable by anybody's measure. So there's a great uh, segment there, uh, pricing segment for uh, con or uh, apartments to slide into. From the investor's perspective, there's this deep demand for quality rental housing. As I said, the last, uh, you know, most of the housing is over 40 years old. It doesn't have ensuite washers and dryers. It has no uh, old kitchens, no air conditioning. And so uh, our renters are flocking to these investor units. Transit infrastructure, again, is a very significant driver of development, but only when it's at a high order. Again, I stress the fact that high order means comes very regular, goes both ways, it's reliable, and it's affordable. So really the measure is, when can I start to not need my car? And right now, that's really just subway infrastructure. Employment in the core, we talked a little bit about that. And again, relevant to new market is, uh, in Toronto, relatively speaking, development charges are a bargain, and property taxes are lower. And another key issue that uh, may be less apparent is in Toronto, you require less parking. And parking is a very significant burden on the uh, condominium development economics. So let's look at a new market for a bit. Affordability issues are not as acute. I would say uh, half a million dollar townhouse is still not a bargain. It's still, the pricing has become an issue to a new market with the uh, average townhouse at $514,000. That's an average resale. I dare say it'd be hard to find a new sale for $500,000. In Newmarket, you have a smaller pool and your buyers groups are less diverse. And some of those buyer groups, you're com frankly, you're competing with urban centers. So if I'm a young person and I'm looking for to enter into the market, looking for a one bedroom or a bachelor, I'm pretty mobile. My, if my job's in Toronto, I'm probably looking in Toronto, and that's got to be an issue for a place like Newmarket. Is you don't, you, it'd be really nice to keep those young people living in your community instead of migrating to affordable housing products in the city. Your buy groups typically uh, trend to the older, and uh, and that's our, your empty nesters and your seniors. So these are the people who have connections with Newmarket. They want to stay in Newmarket. They want to downsize, uh, but there's a problem with that buyer group. Uh, different from investors and first-time buyers, they take a long time to make a decision to buy. 
So a developer is always concerned about how fast he can sell his product. He's not selling one house. He's selling 200 houses or 100 houses at one time. And he's got to get through that sales program in a reasonable period of time. And so if all my buyers are seniors, that's a challenge. If they're investors, they might buy it in a weekend, as they do in Toronto frequently. But here, it'll be slower. And these, uh, and these buyers are uh, also put pressure on developers because they require more parking. Sometimes they want two parking spaces. And, uh, and they want, again, larger suites. They want a suite that they can move their dining room suite into and some of their family furniture. Viva Investments, very important. Town of Newmarket, in our view, is starting to lay the table for this investment, and transit is very important to that. And transit, not only where the transit is, when the transit's coming, but where it's coming. And on the Davis Drive, uh, you know, connecting the transit to the hospital is a really great node and a great starting place for that transit. It gets, you know, it creates jobs and, and it's a destination. Your secondary plans in place, the policy, policy context approved with the exception of the parkland dedication piece, which we understand, uh, but that's another good piece in, in place. And, Mar and Newmarket's got some great uh, advantages going for it. It's got that small town feel with the big town uh, amenities. It uh, benefits from better perceptions of safety and inclusiveness for, uh, for the community members. But you also have to recon recognize that over time, demand is still softer, which drives smaller buildings. We're, we're unlikely to get 600 unit buildings in Newmarket for a long time to come. But you will get 50, 100, and 150 unit buildings that are measured against the market characteristics. But it's important to consider those implications on the pace of demand, especially with respect to assessment growth. And I just put a chart of what's happening in Hamilton right now, because there are some similarities. Hamilton, Hamilton uh, completely different urban context, we understand, but no less challenged in terms of trying to attract investment into their downtown. And in a lot of ways, their, their situation is what, much worse because downtown have been hollowed out after, uh, because of the uh, economic shifts that have been occurred there. But eight years ago, this chart just shows uh, single uh, housing types by year from 2006 to 2015. And you can see the dark, uh, the, you can see where the condo uh, starts are just starting only now to start rebound. And even still, it's 200 units a year. It's 150 units a year. And this is a city that's uh, invested $20 million in McMaster coming downtown and, uh, and, a, and a whole wave of other uh, municipal investments, including development charge waivers, parkland dedication fee, fee waivers, and uh, municipal, uh, municipal loans to high-density developers. So the point of showing the slides is that it's a process in terms of attracting investment. And, it, and um, Markets just don't immediately respond. They take a time. To, they take time to mature, and um, in Hamilton, that just seems like it's it's starting to happen. In fact, we've been retained by the city of Hamilton right now to see if it's okay now to start releasing those uh, municipal incentives that they've been offering for the last eight years. This is a chart I did last week just to help you understand some of the economics. And really, I've, I, again, it's. It's not a, I'm not trying to say that uh, Newmark is competitive to Toronto or we're competing any other ways, but it's a really useful example to show essentially that the hard costs of developing a condo really don't change whether you're in Waterloo or uh, Newmarket or downtown Toronto. It still kind of costs you about 200 bucks a foot to build a condo. And your soft costs, and those are the costs associated with consultants, marketing, your financing costs, they're still about the same, about $85 a square foot. There's a huge difference in your land cost. Downtown Toronto, average price around $65 a square foot. That's the average price. Certainly much higher prices in some, some parts of the city. But that's a difference of maybe $35 a square foot. But a big one is the parking cost. You may, realize, you may or may not realize that in the city of Toronto, you can, when you uh, offer a parking spot uh, with a unit, typically that's paid for uh, separately. Average price of a parking lot downtown Toronto is about $45,000. Costs about $80 a square foot to build a parking lot, parking space. So more or less break even on the cost of building parking for a developer. There's no incentive for a developer to build parking in the city of Toronto. And that's why it's an advantage not to have to build one space for every unit. 
when you get to new market, sometimes you have to, well, for more, more, more often than not, that parking space is included in the purchase price. So for every parking spot you build, that's a burden of $30 a square foot on the pro forma that Toronto doesn't share with you. And then your development charges, and this, I'm just assumed the maximum rate in both Toronto and Newmarket. You can see in Toronto that's $26 a square foot. In Newmarket, it's double that. It's $50 a square foot. It's the same across York Region. So when you come all the way down to it, your delivery costs are about $20 uh, a square foot more in uh, Newmarket than they are in uh, downtown Toronto. And that gets worse because the revenue in downtown Toronto, the average revenue, the average price per square foot of a condo in downtown Toronto is $548 a square foot. Here it's about $420 a square foot. Now $420 is what we forecast by doing a little bit of market work because there hasn't been a recently uh, launched high density development here. But you can already see we've got this price elasticity in the city of Toronto where you have all these buyer groups that are available to you. Where we don't have as many buyer groups available to us, we've got a very focused market. It's mostly seniors, a few first-time buyers, and there's some very, very non-elasticity in that price. So you can see when you look at profit, it's not hard to understand why the market chooses Toronto over 905 communities such as New Market. Again, this is not this is not uh, uh, isolated to New Market alone. It's not. It's basically the same economics everywhere you go, outside of the 905. And uh, yeah, the profit is 31% in Toronto, where in New Market it's 6%. And when your profit's about 6%, a developer starts thinking, I can do other things with this money. It's really simple. You know, I can invest it in the market, maybe get 5% at less risk than building a condominium development. And it would also add to, for when a developer is assessing risk for a, a condominium development, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of money to be made in condominium development. There's no question about it. But there are many, many ways to lose money. When you look at a performance <coughs> of a single family detached house, you know, single family detached developments, you can phase it. If a market starts to fail, you can stop construction, you can hold off for a couple years, you can park things. You start building a condo, you gotta finish it. You get halfway through a, you ha get halfway through a condominium development and the market chokes, or you have a drywaller strike, or you have any number of things that can impact that line item of a performa, which is typically 250 lines or more long, and things start to go bad south. And we, you, you hear a lot about the successful projects uh, in Ontario, and uh, you don't hear much about the bad projects. And we, get, we see our fair share of projects that go south for that reason. So some of the strategies that other municipalities have employed, and some that you're doing already, you know, is, uh, you know, community improvement plans are typically the heart and soul of trying to uh, bridge this gap between these high costs and these market, market uh, realities. And allowing the market to uh, um, ease its way into your community. And I say ease its way into it because you shouldn't think about the market as a static thing. Affordability is not going to change in new market. The affordability is going to get worse. And that's because we've got this provincial policy uh, uh, in place that's really put, drawn a line in the sand on, low density, on our land supply. So that's going to make low density product very, very expensive. It's already very, very expensive. And that's going to help us in terms of supporting high density development. So that'll change over time, but it'll take a while. But in the meantime, as in other communities, you might think about some sort of development charge waiver or even deferrals. Deferrals can help a lot because what it does do is it takes some of those initial costs that a developer has to invest at the beginning of development and pushes them out to a point closer to when he starts receiving his revenues. And what that does is reduces financing costs. And if you've got a, if you've got a, um, a construction loan that's got a balance of $40 million, uh, that can have a huge impact on the developer's bottom, bottom line. City of Hamilton's gone as far as to uh, uh, providing municipal loans to developers. And again, that's a, up to $5 million, I think, per project. And it's in a sense, acts as mezzanine financing. And it helps them get through those early stages of a project where, um, where maybe the bank, traditional banks, aren't too um, um, uh, encouraged to invest in a community. And in Hamilton, it's been helpful. In fact, the uh, default rate on those loans has been very, very low, and, um, 
and the result has been a fairly significant amount of uh, new high density development there. Obviously, you can waive planning fees and any, all the other municipal fees that are attached to developments. Um, but it's also, you, you may think about just giving grants because when you start waiving planning fees or you start waiving development charges, it has a sort of ripple effect through your budgets, as we're well aware. Sometimes it's just better to recognize that as a grant. The things to think about is we've been advocating with the City of Toronto is to relax parking standards. You know, we, we're, we don't understand, frankly, why the City of Toronto even cares about parking. Um, Parking is a huge issue. It's a big burden on developers, as, I, as, I, as I've explained before. And the only issue we get back from the city is that if we don't provide enough parking, then people will be uh, overspilling into the neighborhood. And I say, uh, if you don't provide enough parking, no one's going to buy your condominium unit because people want to uh, know if parking is important to them, they'll want to know where the parking is. And if people do uh, overspill into the neighborhood, to me, that's an enforcement issue. Uh, fast tracking approvals has significant value to developers if they knew that, for example, their if everybody had a, if had a, a project in Davis Drive that's over uh, 50 units, let's say, or 100 units, it meets the minimum density requirement. If you said to them, we're going to get you through the process in three months, that's, that adds a great deal to uh, the certainty of the project. One of the, again, the other issue we have to always remember is a developer starting a project today he has to account for any market fluctuations that might happen right up to the time it gets to about 70% sold. So if it takes some six months or 10 months or a year to get through the planning process, he hasn't even sold a unit. And maybe the market's gone south, their pricing has gone up, or maybe the costs have gone up, and he, he needs to be able to adjust to that, or she. Another strategy that's new that we've just again proposed to some of our clients is instead of taking all those development um, charges and those incentives and bundling them up and giving them to a developer, we suggested uh, bypassing the developer and giving them to the purchaser. And the reason we suggest that is that, uh, one, if you, there's always giving money to developers can be a, goes in a bit of a black box. You may see the benefit, you may not, and council may not be sure if it actually got to where it needed to be. You're never sure. But if you gave that money directly to the purchaser in the form of down payment assistance, then it has exactly the same impact, except this time it goes straight to the purchaser. And this is where maybe it helps your young buyer. And maybe it's, a, it's the difference of moving to Toronto or Markham or Vaughan Metropolitan Centre and staying in the community. If you said to them, look, we're going to give you a second mortgage in the value of whatever the incentive is, all of a sudden that makes your product in the new market vastly more affordable and probably would be an interesting incentive. And the biggest, the second biggest piece is that you get that money back eventually. You get that back when the mortgage is refinanced or the house's apartment is sold. Or, um, and so it's, it, it, it in fact becomes a deferral rather than a waiver. And the last piece is something that you're already doing on your Hollingsworth projects as you're thinking about vending in some land. We think that's an excellent um, uh, strategy. If you have other public lands that are designated in that way, we think that uh, these are great ways to lead by example and um, give uh, confidence in the market that uh, the buyers are there and, um, and leverage uh, good value for you. So th those are my comments. It's really a big subject that I've tried to boil down into 19 slides, but um, I hope that'll uh, spawn some questions and some discussion. Thank you. Councillor Sponga, questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Conway. Uh, great presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is that um, anecdotally this weekend, um, I was in Aurora um, looking at some of the condos developments that are occurring there. And um, it happened back in mind thinking, okay, well, I'll get some understanding. And actually, I had an opportunity to raise this question with a um, uh, director of uh, uh, sorry, economic development uh, officer, uh, I believe on Friday. Um, I understand, uh, um, you know, that Toronto is a good example in, in terms of the condo uh, development and everything that is happening um, in terms of Toronto, but also in terms of as Toronto um, is, uh, you brought a very valid slide that showed some marketing material that was out in Asia. 
uh, how Toronto stacks uh, in a global market rather than just in a GTAA market. Um, I was really curious to see, I, I, my question is really, why are we comparing new market to Toronto to a certain extent or we're using the Toronto model where we're seeing an aurora just south of us um, and a flourishing of uh, mid to high density projects that are actually happening and sold. Um, and I was very surprised to see the amount of people um, that were uh, visiting these uh, um, sales centers on the weekend. Uh, yet, Aurora is not being identified as a, a regional or provincial urban center. Um, it has uh, not gone through the same mandated legislation um, that uh, uh, Newmarket has had to react. Uh, PPS, uh, places to uh, grow, uh, coming down, the regional OP, uh, the identification of uh, one of the four urban centers and so forth. So why, and, uh, why are we seeing then um, this uh, boom relative to the sizes of, of the communities in Aurora um, rather than in Newmarket? That's my first question. The other one is, um, on several occasions, we've heard about um, incentivizing development, and I think we've done a great job with the pilot project at 212 Davis Drive, uh, with the deferrals of uh, DCs and so forth. But at the end of the day, the town of Newmarket, um, the, the, the intensification that has been my, uh, mandated, um, and the targets that have been set, minimum targets, growth targets set by the province, the region, and so forth. Um, where is the commitment um, from the province and the region, their responsibility to say the town of Newmarket is going to be uh, facing having to provide infrastructure, uh, amenities, and so forth to um, support the quality of living uh, that will occur once this intensification takes place. So it's very important for the town of Newmarket to be able to have the revenues uh, to provide those services. Um, and by talking about waiving DCs or uh, parking in lieu or cost of parking, et cetera, parkland dedication, you're kind of eroding away at that um, at the front end. Um, what is the province, what is the role of the province and the role of the region to take an active role and the leading role as they did in putting the policies together? Uh, what is their role in incentivizing this development to, to occur in the urban centers? So first question is, why is it occurring in Aurora? Um, why is Aurora getting 15-minute transit? Newmarket isn't. But yet the province and the region are identifying Newmarket as the urban center. We see the development happen in Aurora, but not here. Uh, can you answer those two questions? Mr. Conway. I can, I can help. There's quite an array of uh, items there to, to address, but go ahead. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I can't answer the second question. First of all, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I, I'll only say that uh, it, it is as strange to us as it is to you that uh, on one hand, the, uh, the government encourages intensification, but um, with the exception of um, transit investment, uh, doesn't seem to recognize the economics that are in play. Um, why, why Aurora is getting new investment <coughs> is, it, it, to a lesser extent than you are. I think all, you just have to look at Aurora to see where you're going to be. It's really, the, gra the first graph shows it all, that the demand is moving its way out from the GTA. And if you look at Aurora, you'll, er, uh, you start to get a glimpse of what might be here. And as I said earlier, you're gonna, you've already s starting to lay that table, and you'll start to see some of the investment. One of the things we didn't talk about in our presentation that will have an impact on, that is having an impact in Aurora and it will have an impact on you is the um, uh, six story wood frame uh, um, allowances in the building code, which will have a significant impact on the economics. There, it will reduce costs by about 15% over the hard costs, which will make things um, um, very much more feasible for developers and you can look to see some of that coming in new market. But really, it's just the progression of demand, and um, and the market the market wants to be close to the jobs and the culture and all the uh, of the magnet of the down, of downtown core. It's as simple as that. So we'll see it slowly. We'll see it slowly move its way, and um, yeah, look to it as being uh, the canary in the coal mine, if you will. So, in conclusion, would you say then that 
um, there has to be a better engagement, I mean, or, or better involvement in terms of the province um, and uh, to a certain extent the regional, although I'm sure they're trying as much as they can right now um, to support that development occurring in the market. I, I think without, I, I think the province is going to have a hard time meeting, it's uh, showing that its provincial growth targets are going to be met just without understanding uh, the economics in play and, and there's going to have to be a recalibration at some point. Because okay. it's uh, not just new market, you know, look at, look at the county of Haldeman, you have the same 40% target for essentially as a rural community. And uh, lastly, um, so you're saying that regardless of what the town of new market can do, um, and it needs the upper, uh, the upper level of governments to cooperate and, and be in, in unison with uh, whatever we move. At the end of with whatever we, however we try to incentivize that development, at the end of the day, though, development is the nature of development. Um, and uh, it's the nature of, of profit and uh, uh, demand that it's going to drive where the development is going to occur. That's, that's exactly right. Thank you. Mr. Sheldon, are you aware of any incentives that are being offered by Aurora that, that I mean, we've got uh, Slusher Square, we've got Young and Millard, we've got the Orsi development, we have Clock Tower uh, that are not moving forward yet. Uh, is it, what's the difference between what's going forward in Aurora uh, versus, uh, versus Newmarket? I've uh, asked myself that question as well, and I'm not aware of incentives. I don't know if um, our planner is, um, but it, it may be just that it is migrating to the north. I do notice that the, um, the heights in Aurora are not, uh, they're not like, you know, 20-story buildings or anything like that. They're fairly, um, I, th I would think they're under about 10-story. But uh, what I was going to say, Mr. Mayor, for the audience, I'm not sure if, they're, if they picked up on the point that was made about the provincial change uh, as of the beginning of this year to permit six-story what uh, is referred to as bricks and sticks uh, buildings in Ontario so the building code has been modified uh, that has been in place in California or in uh, well California for a while but in BC and now it's in Ontario and the builders are trying to work out a way to deal with that uh, in this um, climate of Ontario in terms of expansion joints and so on. We had a good presentation in that regard, but that is now permitted in Ontario. So you could see a uh, less expensive uh, construction form that was limited to four stories now going to six, just for the audience. Okay, maybe staying with that, Mr. Nethery, uh, what is the minimum that we're looking at in our secondary plan along the Davis Drive corridor? Do you mean uh, in terms of height, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, well, there are uh, different categories in there. So in some areas, you're uh, permitted, you know, four to six, and then others, depending on where you are, much considerably higher than that. Okay. So it's not like we're requiring a minimum of eight, and that has no influence. Regional Councillor. Uh, thanks very much for uh, an interesting presentation. I'm, uh, I, uh, as you're going through the presentation, I. Uh, I had the sensation, and I think it was the feeling of wind coming out of my sails to a certain degree. I'm sure that's not your entire intention, but when you see the some of the numbers that lead up to, and especially the uh, the, the, the sort of the your slide, um, I'll try to find it here, but, uh, that shows the difference in profitability essentially uh, between Toronto and uh, Newmarket. Um, you certainly see what what we're experiencing to a degree, and um, I guess. My question, I mean, I have several of them, but one of them is, what would, you take a Young and Millard, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's been approved now for uh, two plus years, probably, um, for two 125 uh, unit buildings, I'm guessing, around 10, 11 stories. Um, and they haven't even attempted to put up sales. That, I, I mean, we, we, we had the impression they would. Is, is that just indicative of everything you said here, or is there anything else at play? What, what would be, if you were discussing with them, would you? I guess another, let, let me put it a different way. I, I've been wondering for a while, what do you think will be the response to the first 100 unit building in the new market? What's your, I mean, you're, you're, well, you're more, you're more uh, familiar with this than, than I am. So. I, well, I, I mean, first of all, it's really important to understand the point that I made earlier, that the market is never static. It is always moving. So when I present information to you today, it's about today. 
and the and the and pricing and construction costs will change as we move forward and we think that's all going to bode in favor of intensification so the market will move to you over time it's just that when you're thinking about what's going to happen today and the types of um, uh, charges you're about to lay on development you have to be mindful of that what's happening in that application, I can only imagine that they're facing the development economics that we've talked about today, especially with very tall construction built, uh, concrete buildings that have large number of units. When you have large, when you have a, again, a, uh, when you have a large number of units, you have to get, no, very, you have to have a high level of confidence that you're going to get through that sales program very quickly. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I think there's a market today for a relatively large building near the hospital on Davis Drive. I think that in that, that's the sort of area where we would say there's a, probably a pretty good pool of buyers. You'll have young people that are working long hours that probably, you know, don't need, or, or are single and don't need a lot of space but want a close work uh, proximity. And there's people that like the idea, especially older people, of being close to a hospital. It just gives you a sense of security. And not, to, and not the least of which is other people just like the animation and the activity and the fact that transit's coming. So when you look at Newmarket, don't look at it as the whole town. Look at it at, at a very fine grain level. <clears throat> if you put yourself at Young and Davis, Young and Davis, it's kind of suburban out there. It doesn't seem to be a lot of idea, you know, sense that there's any sort of thing walkable about it. That's got to uh, mature a bit. But further on the corridor, you can see it happening. You can see happening today. Okay. Um, the, uh, the the default in, in, at rate in Hamilton. I just a quick question. But you said that it was very very low. But they, they've had some some default on the on the loans. Yes. They have like one or something. I'd have to look back at my notes. But because they, they clearly haven't had that many examples from the chart you've shown up, you know, building a year at most. Yeah, it's like 15 yeah. buildings. Okay. Um, the I guess the question that for us is. You know, as we look at the examples of types of approaches we could take to potentially try and incentivize in one form or another, and we've, we've, we've done a little bit of that already, or we're exploring one, and we've done one a little bit. Um, what sh you sh I guess it, it's a leap from here to here, which says, so here's where the market seems to be at. Here's some strategies. But if the market is not close enough to make the strategies viable, then you're putting strategies out there either for nothing or perhaps, um, um, you know, they're being picked up by something that was going to occur anyway. I mean, so what's your read that is the market close enough that these stra that some of these strategies or, or a combination of these strategies could actually um, be successful? I mean, you, I, you haven't said that. I mean, I know they're here, so I assume you think, but I just oh, curious. Yes, it's, uh, they're definitely, you know, you, you will have demand even without incentives at some point. It's just going to, what we're really talking about here is how can we accelerate the market, support it, create a, a, a sense that it can happen, if you will. And so you've already, you've got some interest already, I know, in the, in the corridor and uh, again close to the hospital. That seems to make some market sense to us. It's what happens, the corridor is also a very large geographic area and you, presumably want to have that happen sooner than later. And if they want that to happen, then the community improvement plan is a way to do that. It's also important to note, you know, we just finished doing a study for the City of Toronto that's not kind of similar. And the City of Toronto asked us to look at priority neighborhoods, areas like Jane and Finch that get no investment. And what would happen if the city said, oh, well, if you're going to uh, if you're going to build something at Jane and Finch, we'll, we'll waive development charges for you. And they asked us, would that make sense? And came back to the city and said, no, it wouldn't make sense because you really have to look at all these places. And it, the same might be for uh, the centers, is, uh, you, is there might be other issues that are impeding uh, high density development. And we said to the city, it may be that in some place a park might have just as much of an economic impact and motivating factor for the market than a development charge waiver, like a really well-planned park. Um, in some places, um, lot fragmentation is a hu huge issue. Being able to consolidate parcels of historical landowners that have small pieces of land to get to one big piece might be an issue. And that, these are the sorts of things that you can uncover with a community improvement plan is what are, what are the real issues on a 
site-by-site -site, uh, basis across uh, the whole secondary plan area. And uh, you just may find yourself breaking it up into different places that have, each has a different strategy. So uh, last uh, question, could you, could you t I, I didn't, can you tell me a little bit more about the detail of how uh, down payment assistance works? And, and then if, is there any examples of that? Is that relatively, uh, I haven't heard of that before. And has anybody well, actually tried that? Yeah, well, in, uh, if you're familiar with the options for homes yeah. model, that's essentially the same thing. Sure, yeah. Options for Homes basically says, we're not going to do any fancy marketing materials. We're not going to do anything except, what, you know, come to our trailer and look at our pricing. And, uh, and they buy cheap land sort of in off-demand areas. And uh, homeowners benefit by that because part of that, uh, part of that uh, savings is uh, 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 capitalized into a second mortgage, which is essentially a uh, second mortgage funded by um, home ownership alternatives and um, uh, the homeowner pays no interest or no principal for the light while they own the unit when they sell the unit that uh, mortgage is retired secured against the property and it comes back to the uh, to the uh, funding agency In this case the city the town would be the funding agency so it's I just it, it's only been done by options for homes. We think we've taken that model and said, why couldn't a municipality do that for their benefit? And I just, I just think it's a more transparent way of giving money, which is essentially what we're talking about, than uh, giving it straight to the developers. And we've also talked to developers about that, and the developers are they're encouraged too because they say to us, when we come to these municipalities, we get a lot of people um, interested. And especially younger people, they, uh, they end up rescinding their purchase because the bank won't give them the financing because their down payment's not big enough. So if we can help them with that down payment, and CMHC has recognized these uh, second mortgages as value against, uh, as, as reducing the down payment, um, uh, they just say that if that can help them accelerate sales, that's a, just another marketing tool they can use. It's interesting. Thank you. Mr. Shelton. I just thought, uh, Mr. Mayor, it would be interesting to note that uh, the Town of New Market did that a uh, number of years ago um, to encourage affordable housing on the other side of Bathurst, on uh, Keith. Um, the details we could provide you with, I uh, can't uh, bring them back immediately, but I think they were forgivable second mortgages. But uh, we did get into that because we were looking specifically at that time of creating an affordable housing unit. Councillor Kerwin and then... Uh the other one to reinforce that, Bob, too, we did that on 290 Davis Drive, but it was a different style where we got them in there for, for rental and then they could sell them afterwards, if you remember that. The apartments. Yeah. No, 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 the further one to the west, the one that banks up against the church. I think we did that then. Anyway, uh, Mark, uh, I, uh, I really thank you for just an absolutely superb uh, presentation. It was uh, uh, one of the reasons that uh, I guess I love being on council is, is the learning curve. Uh, being here is one of the reasons I, I sit on council is, is I take away knowledge every time I come to one of these presentations. So I, I really thank you for that. And uh, on a lighter note, the down payment assistance uh, is, is grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about that. So in a funny way, um, just the other one, foreign investment. I talked to the developers of Sharon, uh, the houses that were sold out there. The people who bought those houses, 60% came from the, the People's Republic of China or auxiliary countries in that area. 60%, 30% was South Asian the Indian subcontinent and what's amazing was Bangladesh and uh, and Sri Lanka were investors I you know mm -hmm. if I include that South Asia it's the whole old crown colony of the Indian subcontinent but 30 percent only less than 10 percent came from local investors uh, that's uh, when you talk about that's really what reinforced but thank you so much um, for this one question I have for you if you have a house and you carve it up into eight rooms and you rent out those rooms on a monthly basis or a yearly basis, is that a tenement house or a boarding house or what would you call it because it's happening quite prevalently in the city of Toronto? 
I, I, through you, Your Worship, I have no idea. You um, know, when you identified not... those small units, those are those small units that I know that's happening now in the City of Toronto. Mm -hmm. But what I'm afraid of, Mark, it's happening now in the town of Newmarket because of the cost of houses. Like a tiny house in my area now is listed for almost 800000 So, you know, these millennials, these people who are young, where do they, where can they live? And even these rooms in the city of Toronto cost $800 per month. So if you have eight, that's $6,400 per month. That's far more than you get if you rent out the house. Like it's a... I think there's some pretty significant building code issues you run into very quickly, especially with respect to fire and safety, but uh, I, I really am not the qualified person to right. answer that question. But just, just in sum, if it's going to ever happen, it's, it's got to be the political will to change what's happening, and I believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about fast tracking, and, and constantly what I hear is the slow process that it goes through and the costs to prepare reports and the costs to do business and that escalates gigantically the price of what you're building. But thank you so much. It's just a, it's a summarization of, uh, of things I've been thinking about. Thank you. I'll invite some comments from uh, Mr. Callio as well. I believe Mr. Shelton and, and municipalities retentions of records are far better than mine but we had a look at a proposal like this relative to George Street at one time. That might have been five, six years ago. Uh, and, and if we could revisit that and see if those principles still, uh, still are, are around, that may be what, what uh, uh, developed into the options for a homes plan. That, but maybe we have some material on that, that that could be helpful if we could get that as part of our consideration. Uh, and Mr. Callio, your comments relative to the economic areas Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to follow up, it's been a while when we mentioned about Aurora, but I wanted to just mention a few things. Uh, we stay in contact with the Economic Development Office in Aurora, and uh, they haven't done anything significant to encourage development, such as some of the things that Mark was talking about. But I think the biggest factor is, again, getting back to the area of cost. We all know housing prices in Aurora are higher than New Market. You mentioned the townhouse average was 514,000 in New Market. I, the, the house, uh, similar place in, in Aurora might be 575. I'm not sure what that range might be. Therefore, that gap between what you can get a $300,000 condo and a, a townhouse pushing 600,000 is more significant in Aurora. Therefore, the profit margin, I would think, for the developer is a little bit higher. But like Mr. Conway said, it is slowly coming this way. Um, so I just wanted to clarify a couple things and, and make a statement about what's happening in Aurora versus potentially in the future what's going to happen here. Thank you. Councillor Sponga? Uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah, if, if, uh, just on, on the point that Mr. Calgary has made, one of the interesting things is that, that there's, uh, if you visit some of the sales offices <coughs> and this new uh, uh, mid to high density development in Aurora, you'll find that there's a very large percentage of new market empty nesters that are buying in there. Um, so I don't think that the factor, the, the, the pricing difference is that much uh, of, of a, a factor when you have people from communities such as Newmarket moving and buying into Aurora. Um, I think it's more of a fact that uh, one of the points that was pointed out, it, it might be the fact that it's closer to the, the, the center of Toronto, um, the cultural perception. Um, the amenities and all these other things that really contribute a lot to attracting purchasers. And so you know you can increase your uh, um, dollar per square foot in terms of uh, your yield uh, because you know that there's that appetite to buy in uh, what is, uh, for some reason or other, and it'd be interesting to see a comparison with Newmarket and Aurora, um, but, you know, the same comparison we've seen with Toronto. Uh, but what people may perceive a more prestigious and more urban or centralized type of community. And, I, I don't see that, but I, I guess that's the perception that it's out there. Thanks. It might be helpful to have a, a park, parking requirements and parkland dedication yeah. comparisons. So that, that would be helpful. Um, good. Now, um, mm -hmm. okay, regional councilor. Yeah, just sort of in terms, I'm just thinking in my head of next steps for ourselves, but I mean, it, it seems to me that there's, there's probably a bit of a need to be somewhat targeted here. And, I, and what I was hearing you earlier say was that um, certainly around the hospital makes sense and uh, you know if you're thinking about community improvement plans we've got to figure out that geography out but um, I, you know it seems to me you know Main Street 
the ghost station so close, access to historic Main Street, which is a, the, you know, somewhat of that uh, feeling of having a, you know, a walkable downtown restaurants. Um, so first of all, I, I mean, I'm, I know you can't say the exact area, but the, it would be wise to start with, uh, or would you recommend us starting with a fairly targeted approach, wherever that is, um, and, and look to some of those uh, discussions that you've had and we've had and, and try to focus in one area for, for getting things moving, incentivization, or, and, the, sorry, and, the se and then the second part is, uh, are you aware of practices or other, well, otherwise successful practices where the next part of targeting is to actually try to, to sit down with, uh, is it something you just put out there and, and, and the market's paying, and, and the developers are paying enough attention, they're watching to see what might help change their pro forma, or is it, is it, is it wise then to take the next step, which is to start sitting down with people one-on-one, -on -one, talking about what could happen, what could make it work, trying to sell them a little bit on it, uh, you know, doing some proactive but very targeted uh, marketing, or what, what approach do you go with from here? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. A few questions there. <laughs> the, um, just about Davis Drive, uh, your instincts are right. You, you have a uh, GO train station and a hospital, two major drivers of, uh, uh, of activity. You've got a, unfortunately, your GO train station's right smack dab in the middle of a floodplain. That doesn't yeah, help development. I, I, <clears throat> I don't know if you have a, I'm sure you have a special policy area uh, piece, but trying to, that's the, that's the where the action's likely going to happen. And if there's something you can do on a fine grain that's going to, bridge some of those issues to stitch those pieces together uh, that's what my, my instinct would be the same as yours uh, um, I'm sorry I forgot you the next part is just to ha and then from there let's say so let's say we, we make some sort of um, targeted approach geographically that it, it, you know we, we because we've got an accompanying report that talks about marketing Davis Drive and how we move forward uh, you know, my gut instincts say to me we should be really trying to do this in, a, in, a, in a, an even more targeted way than that, sitting down with one developer or landowner at a time and having conversations about how to move specific sites forward. Or do you just put, the, put out some potential incentives or potential uh, ingredients and, let, and, and, and trust that the development community will be aware of it and they'll act if they think it's sufficient or if the, if the market's there? Or do you... Do you you roll up your sleeves and start going one at a time, <laughs> working your way through. Uh... Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm a big advocate of meeting with developers. I, nice. I think <clears throat> we pretend to think that we know what developers are thinking, but they constantly prove us wrong, and uh, sometimes we prove them wrong. But it's, you know, engaging with the people that are actually going to make this happen is not a bad idea. I think, you know, if you talk to them today, you're going to get probably a little bit of what I've said to you. Um, but that's not bad in itself and um, something might come out of it but there, there should always be an engagement process with the pe these people both local and uh, new uh, developers that will come to the community and um, just in, just for the simple point of uh, creating awareness of what you're doing and where you're going um, I think you know there's a the big buzz on the street are parkland dedication uh, costs and these fees that's what the whole development community is talking about people call us about that and uh, uh, but what they don't talk about is what you're doing and what you're how you're thinking and you know again if you, the more you can gauge them and give them a, a sense about where it might be going then they they don't take new market off the list they say okay well they're evolving and maybe something can happen there we'll continue to look for land so it's uh, it's very very important uh, and how you engage with them will be a function of the initiatives that come forward I think more than anything and, and finally, I, I guess you'd suggest from some of the things you say here that we take a, a fairly hard look at what municipally owned lands there are in a, in a, in a, in a probably in that targeted area and if there's opportunities Indeed. there. And I'm, not, and I'm not just speaking to, uh, and I mean that, but to Hollingsworth and that discussion debate and we're having that, but there are other opportunities uh, for the town in that area. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. For the, uh, I don't know, are there any other questions from council members before we move to the third part? I was actually giving some thought to maybe taking a bit of a break and then doing the, the, the next portion. Okay, just if, if I may, Mr. Mayor, to respond to a couple of points that were just uh, made. Um, first off, in terms of targeted geographical areas, there's been discussion about that at the uh, staff level, and I think some of it will come out of the staff presentation. But uh, the fact, one of the facts uh, that uh, just remind us all of is that the existing CIP actually goes up into Davis Drive, extends over, includes the tannery, includes land on the south side of Davis Drive. So we have a CIP that um, uh, goes into the Davis Drive area and it does have tools for uh, 
uh, incenting uh, development. Um, we've also focused on other areas, just in brief discussions with Mark about the hospital and perhaps there should be a targeted approach. Um, so that I, I want you to be aware of and I think that will be covered under the uh, policy component. And um, there was another point you made right at the very end and that was on... Uh, yes, yeah, it'll come back to me. I'll, I'll cover that in the presentation. Good, thank you. And the, the real challenge in terms of a C CIP uh, would be what we can do with that. I don't know whether or not it would be easy for us just to extend those boundaries. But what we're looking at is two different approaches. One is that the existing CIP is pretty much restoration and renewal, where what we're looking at is a redevelopment. And so, so the incentives, I think, would be far more significant. And the question has to be is, uh, is it an expense to reduce or waive development charges in relation to uh, the assessment base that you'll be getting and, and or maybe you defer those? So there's a lot of options there I think that we could consider as far as incentive packages and that might be something that I think could well be worthwhile on uh, engaging our NEDAC uh, group with as well. So, so I'm glad to see that they're here. I'm wondering, uh, how long would you see the next segment? I'm just wondering if we should take maybe a 10-minute break, <coughs> and that would give us uh, give us some time to... I think you're, you're looking at a presentation that's about 20 minutes in that area. Okay. Let's, all right, let's take a break, but before that, Councillor Smogger. Yeah, I have one more question for Mark, because I think just the, the, in the last couple of minutes, some really good discussions, some really good points that were raised, um, especially on the extension of the CIP and, and the fact that the present CIP takes on uh, the tannery, um, which is, you know, that's where the GO station is right now. Um, the present CIP, although, and I totally agree with the mayor, is uh, based on restoration of, uh, of a historic center, but it still does provide for waiving of uh, all park land in lieu. Um, waiving all park land requirements, uh, waiving of parking requirements, uh, the 100% rebate of all municipal uh, permits. Uh, it doesn't touch in DCs, and it, and it does have it has a TIF component, but perhaps a TIF isn't that uh, attractive to a developer. It's more attractive to the end user, the tax increment finance. Um, so. But in itself, I think that the 100% the rebate on the municipal permits, the waiving of parkland education, the waiving of parking is some of the points that you touched on earlier. Um, and if, the, is that, if that is in place right now in a node, a specific node such as the tannery, uh, why aren't we seeing the interest? Why, why are we or aren't we? Are we not? Well, again, uh, you know, until you give the development charge waiver is the most substantial piece of that. The rest of it, it's it's not a, it's not going to significantly change that uh, dynamic um, uh, economic dynamic I should say and again it's the other piece is just um, it's the market risk and developers remember um, developers have a lot of choice across this province about where to invest and so if I'm going to if I have a choice between New Market Go Train Station site or I have a choice of uh, Markham I'm going to go where the market market is stronger or Roar. It's as simple as that. But again, that's, that will change. Okay. Mr. Shelton? Yep, my apologies for prolonging this, but that just triggered. The, the other point is we do have staff looking at whether the CIP can be expanded, uh, perhaps towards the hospital. For example, there was a, an expansion to it um, earlier in the program, so that we're not sure what we have to do to go through that because the creation of the CIP does take uh, quite a bit of time. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, why we're not seeing uh, development in the CIP in the northern area of the CIP, you, we would have to budget for that and we'd have to market and focus on that. And the marketing really for the CIP has been more in the downtown area. So, you know, it might be a, looking at the tools because the tools do provide for redevelopment incentives and development incentives, as the councillor pointed out. Mm -hmm. Mr. Callio, and then regional councillor. Yes, just to, uh, Mr. Mayor, just to be clear, we do, within our existing CIP, we do have a, a program that does allow us to waive or reduce uh, the town portion of DCs. So, in, in addition to all the other things that Councillor Sponga mentioned. Okay. The, the town portion of DCs, I don't think, is a substantial part of it, but uh, in any event. Regional Councillor. Sorry. I think really important to that discussion too because if we're talking about a, a, a focused area and the likely area that we've discussed and then the most potential there and Councillor Spong was touching on it 
is uh, the tannery area. It's right at the GO station, et cetera. But as you pointed out earlier, it's, it's almost entirely floodplain. But you mentioned at the time about the special policy area concept, and I believe that's in, re am I correct that's in relation to conservation authorities? Or, and how, can you expand on that a little, maybe? Well, uh, special policy areas are policies that the province will approve, providing you can illustrate uh, uh, that the, the inherent risks of building in the floodplain can be mitigated or absolved. Most, most principally, it's 24-hour safe access. So quite simply, if you, are, if you have a major flood event and your building is completely flooded, they'll want to see that everybody in that building can get from the building to dry land um, Without any, without getting their feet wet, essentially. Right. And, and, I, and I just raise this because I think we've got to look at this site more fully. And I know I, I spoke with the conservation authority, and there are examples of special policy areas in, in this watershed. And uh, um, and I think that if we're going to look seriously at the redevelopment potential of that site, we, we've got to start to look more fully at this uh, this avenue of special policy area um, and what we can and can't do within that. So hopefully we can explore that as we go forward as well. Thank you. So I have uh, 10.30, maybe 10 minute break. We'll come back and we'll continue on. Sorry, 11.30.
All right. Uh, I see we have quorum, so I'll ask uh, members of council to be seated, and we can go forward with the balance of the presentation. We'll start with Commissioner McDougall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, building on, the, on and introducing the next uh, presentation. Uh, I, I, this actually, uh, well, first of all, before I do that, I'd just like to just take a quick second, if I can, and just, again, thank NEDAC members for coming out today as part of their uh, very respective busy schedules. This is going to be an excellent launch pad today to uh, what will be some robust discussions uh, in NEDAC helping to support council's strategic priorities as it relates to, to development along the corridors uh, and other economic development initiatives. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today. It's a, a great introduction for you as, as well as it is for us today. Uh, into this matter. So um, I'm going to uh, start by going back to uh, what is one of the drivers of today beyond the, uh, the big picture stuff that Mr. Nethery had referenced earlier in terms of policy and context. Uh, but we, in a more, from a more immediate sense, uh, there was an information report uh, that was previously distributed and redistributed today. Uh, and, and in there, there was, um, it was responding to some initiatives and work that staff had undertaken following a direction from council, which was, and I'll just take a very quick second to read it, that staff report within 90 days outlining required resources, related costs, and sources of funding available to implement a targeted marketing program to advance the redevelopment of Davis Drive properties for implementation by Q4 2015. And that the report includes how this can be accomplished without impacting the current and proposed economic development plans and initiatives. So following that, there was uh, a cross-department uh, and cross-commission uh, work team that was struck. Uh, some very good internal um, brainstorming had gone on. Uh, it culminated in a uh, smaller working team that did subsequent work to that, uh, and that uh, resulted in this information report, which Council has. And within that, there is an attachment that does reference what Mr. Shelton said around the C current CIP area uh, and the potential to um, uh, you know, consider that in any go forward. So uh, out of that uh, came a, a planning for today and looking at how we would um, want to advance this conversation with Council. And so. Uh, so far we've had the benefit of uh, industry experts and then now we'd like to take it back to again that uh, extract and where we go from here so uh, so really today and for the balance of the workshop you know uh, we'll, we have a very brief presentation and then as staff we'd like to just sit back and listen and learn uh, from the council conversation that goes on and the discussion that will help us scope and inform the next steps as we go forward from this point. So uh, we have uh, Chris Callio and uh, Susan Chase are going to tag team uh, a brief presentation that will hopefully uh, result in, in um, some discussion. At, at the end of it all, uh, we, we're looking at, uh, looking at a, a conversation around how do we differentiate new market from the others? How do we look at enticing the developer to, as they move north out of Toronto, to come to Newmarket and leapfrog uh, some of the communities to our south. What, what uh, will be our points of distinction to help us uh, do that, whether it's on a positioning of the community as a whole, uh, right down through to potential um, the incentivization that, that may go along with helping to make that occur. So uh, with all that being said, I'll turn it over to Chris and Susan and they can um, go into a brief presentation. Okay. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we'll move very quickly here. I know we're running a bit late. We'd like to allow enough time for discussion. Um, with the, uh, the question is, why are we doing this? And, and you've heard some of the comments. Really, we need to engage the public and move forward with trying to encourage intensification. The other aspect that's not on this slide is, uh, even in Mark's presentation, he was referring to residential development. We have to recognize, again, with the secondary plan, 33,000 and 30. 30,000 or 32,000 jobs. This is going to be a major employment corridor. We do not have the land in our employment areas to generate the jobs um, to grow into the future. So this is both residential and employment development that we are talking about on our corridors. So um, there's a couple of things here. We do need to engage. There's a large number of groups, and I'll, I'll refer to some of the groups we need to talk to. Also here, um, we need to be, and it came up in the conversation earlier, about are we embracing change? Are we, for lack of a better word, developer friendly in terms of our processes? The word fast track came up. We really need to look, take a look at that within our 
whole marketing communications plan. We need to be seen by the development industry to move projects along and support what they're trying to do. So it's an important factor that we need to look in this whole marketing communications plan. And we need to incorporate these changes into your strategic priorities as well. Again, there's a number of groups that we need to uh, undertake marketing communications with. How we talk to the developers is going to be different to how we talk to the businesses that may locate within those projects or the residents that may locate within them or even the residents elsewhere in the community that we need to, to generate support. So there's a whole range of different organizations, businesses and groups in the community and outside the community that we need to engage to build support for intensification on our corridors. Okay. And uh, again, as, as Mark mentioned, a lot of it comes down to the return on investment for the developer. And this is, this is critical. We can, we can, New Market's a wonderful community. I think we've got all the amenities that people who want to live here and invest here, but still it does boil down to can a developer make a satisfactory return on, on their investment and, um, and is New Market an area for them that they can minimize their risk to make a, an investment? And that's the challenge and that's the opportunity that we need to move forward. So I'll turn it over to Susan who will talk a little bit more about the next steps, how we see it unfolding. Thanks, Chris. So Ian mentioned that we had the uh, brainstorming session and one of the outcomes of that brainstorming session was a smaller working group that was pulled together to try and come up with some ideas. We had a lot of conversations amongst ourselves and with other people to try and define what we thought some decent next steps might be for this project. One of them, of course, was this workshop, so that's excellent. Um, we also talked about um, finalizing the phasing and the project scope, exactly what do we mean? We've talked about a specific targeted area, do we need it beyond? How do we focus in residence businesses? There's a lot of definition around that scope that's still necessary, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we talked about hosting a developers forum, which is something that was mentioned a little bit earlier. We need to uh, listen to what the developers are, are saying, what their findings are, and uh, learn from them what it is that they need. So we thought we'd host a forum and just invite them in to talk. Um, we want to undertake an internal process review. Um, again, Mark mentioned it earlier, fast track the process. Can we look at our process, see are we putting up barriers, are we making it difficult, are there things that we can do to make it easier to do business here in Newmarket? We need to tell our story a little bit more. We tend to be very quiet here in this town about how amazing we actually are. So we'd like to tell the story just a little bit more, get it out there, invite people to come to Newmarket to find out what we're all about. Main Street is an ex excellent example of the <coughs> vibrancy of this community that's happened the last few years. And there's a buzz around it, so let's keep telling that story. And as Chris mentioned, we've got a lot of stakeholders uh, that we want to talk a little bit more with. There's a lot of expertise at that group. Um, NEDAC is just one of them, the Chamber, we've got our community collaboration group, um, conservation authorities, all those different stakeholder groups. So we really do want to talk to them, find out what they think, how they see this coming together. So I mentioned the outside consultant. Um, the group thinks that we really should engage some of that external expertise that's out there. Um, people who know the develop a company or companies who know the development community, but also know what goes on, how to create that development, um, how to create that buzz. And that group, uh, we see part of the project scope, and this is something that we absolutely want to get defined a little <coughs> bit more here if we can, is identify the marketing strategies across those various uh, stakeholder groups. We acknowledge that the different groups have different requirements. We can't do a one-size-fits-all plan here to move forward. We've got to look at what the different groups actually need. How can we create this revitalized area? We need to address the market concerns that are in the business community. We've heard a lot of them over the last couple of years, certainly. So how do we address those? How do we deal with those concerns? And again, develop unique initiatives specific to those stakeholders. So once we've found out what it is, what their challenges are, how do we help mitigate them? How do we help develop, redevelop, and revitalize that group again? It's also important that we really incorporate with some of the other projects that we've got going on. Um, I'm, the town, we have our broadband project. There's the municipal energy plan. There's a bunch of different community plan projects that are going on. We have to meld this all in, in together to be one grand strategic vision. But York Region, uh, we need to work with them as well. For example, they've engaged a marketing communications firm right now and an ICI realtor firm um, <coughs> who's developing what they need to do for their centres and corridors from their perspective. And we absolutely have to dovetail with that particular project. 
Some of the other next steps, uh, again, review our internal operational procedures for new innovative opportunities, business approaches. Are we putting up barriers? Can we make it easier? Are there things that we can do to make development here in Newmarket be more positive and make sure that they understand that we are open for business? We want to, we want to do some work here. Identify the policies and tools to support our vision. So that gets into like the parking issues, uh, the CIPs, grants, all the different things that we've talked about today. So how we, we really need to get a firm handle on those things and what can we do and what does it mean to us moving forward. Identify potential funding grant opportunities. Um, not just providing grants to others, but for us to receive a grant. For we talked earlier about the province, you know, they're putting these uh, restrictions on us or <coughs> targets that we have to meet. But what kind of help can we get from them? And we think there might be some opportunities not, you know, we keep, we always apply for grants around here, um, so maybe we can find some targeted ones that we can move forward with again. And then of course, we need to report back to Council uh, with our findings and the recommendations for moving forward. So with that, I'm going to toss it back to Ian to wrap up. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, uh, just a final slide and beginning with the end in mind, uh, we ultimately want to help create a desire to do business in Newmarket. And really, there's a number of factors that we've identified. If we're able to uh, to gain awareness and, and garner uh, interest and confidence, uh, as well as uh, promoting a return on on, a, on investment, uh, and have predictable processes that support that, so really uh, that will result in this desire to do business in new market. Uh, so we, we'd like to to now um, you know benefit from from listening to council in terms of scoping uh, our next steps. Again, we do see that there is a benefit to having uh, ec external expertise help us along the way, whether it be in a, in a uh, multi-phased approach, so we, we do bits at a time to report back in, or do something on a, uh, a larger scale and really have the full and complete plan that comes back to Council. So uh, at this time, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll turn it back and, uh, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Okay. That do we, we have, have. Uh, timelines in mind with respect to uh, when this, when these recommendations will be coming back to us? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, it uh, will depend on the approach we take. If uh, if we take a, a, a multi-phased approach, we'd be coming back to council obviously a lot sooner with uh, incremental steps and uh, and accomplishments. Uh, we would like to move this forward uh, as soon as possible. This would be uh, from the basis of one of the very preliminary discussions we would have with NEDAC. Uh, and we would be looking to advance this uh, very quickly. So it would depend on, on uh, whether it's an RFP, whether we are sole source, uh, depending on how we best uh, feel we can advance what we need to achieve. And then ultimately, whichever party we're working with uh, to help us walk through a process, they would help determine the time frame. But we would be looking as staff to move this forward as quick as possible. Okay, so as we come forward with the next re report, um, what we would have then would be um, things that we need to have in place and a prioritized list on moving things forward uh, that will be able to advance our timelines. So th that would be one of the things that I would be looking for in, in, the, in the next steps. Regional Councillor. Thanks very much. Uh, I, so I, I have some fairly specific feedback and um, um, I think it's probably in this day and age of uh, this might not sound right at first but I guess I I you know, there's, there's so much talk about public consultation, et cetera, but I actually think the staff report in this presentation, um, the direction is a little bit too, not too much, but a little bit too much public engagement and public facing. I'm seeing, you know, community at large, local residents, local businesses, innovation team, chamber of commerce, and the phrase, you know, that was used during that particular slide too was that we need to build support for intensification. I, I feel like we're, we've moved past that point. We've we've got an official plan, a secondary plan. We did public consultation. We did kitchen works. We, we've We've consulted and consulted. We know where we are. There's some people who perhaps don't love the direction. There's many who do. I, and I don't think Marketing Davis Drive is about convincing the town that we need to do this. I think the, the presentation we heard and the discussion we're having is, is that we, I, I, and, I, and I believe even in terms of um, some of the, 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 the marketing of the Davis Drive and having even a developer's round table, I suspect there's no harm, but I just think it's time to get very targeted and meeting with people one-on-one -on -one specific sites that was mentioned about you know getting developers to leapfrog and look at us but you don't need them to leapfrog if they're already here so identify uh, find the priority sites um, who's already uh, owns land that is in the development it, it, business and are already there and and sitting down and taking our the, the looking at the PIC you know obviously we gotta let, set the table first but look at the PIC build 
build the case that was discussed by staff about what's great about Newmarket, what's unique, what, what can we offer, et cetera. But a lot of them will hear that everywhere. But sure, that's got to be part of your discussion when you sit down and talk, hospital, downtown Main Street, um, et cetera. But I just, I think we need to do a lot of the work that's being discussed here, but seeing our audience to being one meeting at a time and one site. And I think we have to do, I know it's called Marketing Davis Drive, or that's the, the title we put to it, but I think we have to look at some very specific sites. And I, and I was thinking even during the break about, you know, the best marketing you can have is, is a project that's moving forward, right? Uh, it, it gets the attention of others. So if we can actually find it, you know, look at some sites, prioritize them, and start to talk about what are the ingredients, of each unique ingredients of each one, and who do we meet, you know, to meet with? And so if it's the tannery, do we need to sit down with the developers there, the conservation authority, town staff, and start to look at what tools we have to make that land more productive? Or do we look at the whole idea of the... Uh, I forget what it's called exactly, but the lending, and look at a piece of town-owned land and that, an RFP at a specific site with um, some CIP uh, incentives attached to it. But I, I guess so, you know, I could go on for a while, but I, I believe that our, our, this, I don't, I'm not actually very keen on going out and trying to convince the town or building support for intensification. We've been through that discussion, debate, and battle. We know where we're at. We've got a secondary plan, and, and we've got a council that's prepared to, to move in that direction. So let's move there um, and I and I think that we need to be very strategic and site focused and you know look at a handful of prime ones and really work like in-depth uh, partnership you know discussions with a few people and a few sites to try to to move a pr projects forward and I think if we if it's too much of a marketing plan and I'm not saying that's by any means what was only in here there was much more than that obviously um, but I think that we want to err on the side of targeted, uh, strategic, site-by-site -site analysis and approach um, than a larger outreach or marketing plan. And I, I recognize fully that was all in there, but my feedback would be much, much heavier on that side. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Bizant. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks very much for the presentation. I guess I'm going to come at this a little, a little co contrary to Regional Councillor. Um, as everybody knows, I think I'm, I'm a very big proponent of, of public consultation, and I don't necessarily know that there's a, a best before date for public consultation, how much you do and when you should do it, but rather that some, that's something I believe should be consistently ingrained in um, concept development as well as in marketing plans. And, and, and true, we have a, a secondary plan. There was public consultation and engagement that went into the development of that. But I guess I, I'm still um, hearing and concerned that, that there's a perception of, you know, we don't want to grow anymore. We don't want to change anymore. Uh, it's only going to bring all the negatives to us, to our town. It's going to increase traffic congestion. I heard a, a radio um, interview uh, not that long ago that suggested that the town's plan for intensification was actually um, going to kill the existing businesses along Davis, which really surprised me because I think, you know, even intuitively you would, you would think that the opposite is the case. The more intensification, the more walkability there is, the better support there will be for local businesses along that corridor. However, there's, there's still that, that belief. So if, even if we don't sort of continue to go on the path of uh, you know, public consultate, formal public consultation meetings and workshops and so forth, what I was also looking for is, is then how do we look at then communicating the benefits of intensification? Given that you know, we've got the plans, we, yes, we have to move on, we have to be more strategic, more targeted, but how do we sort of start to bake in our communications, the value proposition to the community? And that community, I think, has to include the business community because I'm not totally convinced from discussions I've had that all of the business community has necessarily bought in or, or um, sort of understood the, the need for this and the value that this would bring. So I guess I would just be looking for, within the marketing plan, you know, how do we ensure that there is sort of con that constant um, uh, reassurance and also um, reinforcement 
that, that this is important, this is necessary, that it really is going to, to build and add to the quality of life who, to the people who already live, in he, live here, uh, who do business here, um, who employ here, and are, are you know, looking for, for that expansion and benefit. So that's, that's something I, I still feel is, is quite important, and I'd be looking for that element within our, our communications, our marketing plans, and so forth. Thank you. Councillor Sponga. Thank you. Um, I think there's really good points for being raised. Uh, one of the questions that, uh, I, and I think uh, I, I tend to agree that there has to be uh, a multi-pronged approach. Uh, yes, you have to have, if, if you're going to promote, um, if you're going to go and market uh, a new market to the development industry or uh, outside stakeholders, then you want to ensure that you have the support of the community in that marketing plan. So, of course, you want to go through that, um, that process where you have the reassurance that your team is with you. Um, that yes, we want the intensification and, and uh, for very good reasons. But at the same time, I, 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 I think there's a lot of value in some of the points the regional council and uh, regional councilors mentioning in a targeted approach. Um, and uh, yes, you have landowners uh, on, on in our centers already, um, and uh, we have uh, also a number of developments that have been approved, and yet we don't see them move forward. I think that the example of, of, of the Kerbal property at Young and Millard is a very interesting one. Um, we've had a number of discussions uh, uh, in relations with the Kerbal group, given it's different projects, probably different people involved, different teams involved, but we've had that conversation with Kerbal um, in terms of the Glenway redevelopment, but we never talked to Kerbal about what's holding them back from actually moving forward uh, with the Young and, development, uh, Young and Millard development. Uh, we have probably one of the biggest players um, in the province in terms of uh, uh, developers and, and development industry and uh, property owners, it's uh, Tridel, um, Cadillac Fairview, uh, 130 Davis Drive, an incredible strategic property uh, close to the downtown, um, uh, vast property. If there's one property that really lends itself well uh, to a very dense type of development is that. Uh, when was the last time we sat down with Tridel and tried to you know, scope why aren't they, what, what's in their horizon for this property. Uh, it's pretty much under val, uh, underused right now. There's about 30, 40% uh, vacancy rate in that plaza, in that strip plaza. Why are they not moving forward? Um, so I think um, that there's a very, very valid, uh, 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 some of the points the regional council theater is raising, I think are very valid. And I think you have to have that one-on-one -on -one with these developers. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, as Mark said earlier, you know, parking in lieu, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, parking requirements uh, are onerous on the developers, so are uh, uh, um, some of the permitting system, the permitting fees and so forth. Uh, we know we're waiving some of the DCs in, 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 in the CAP area, although limited that area, geographic area within the, um, the Davis Drive corridor. By why isn't there the take up? Um, is there something that has to change? Uh, is there a perception issue? Do we have to sell new market from a different perspective? So I think that really you're only gonna get that information by sitting down with the people that are at the end of the day gonna put the shovel on the ground. So I think that that's a, a very good starting point. Okay. Good. I don't think that we're in disagreement with uh, what's being presented. And, uh, and my own thought is, is that uh, both of these approaches can be done concurrently. I, I, I still have a sense of urgency that I think that we need to do something to move forward. Uh, but, but broad consultation uh, and a good example of that was the success that we saw in Windsor when they went forward with a project called IT Matters. And uh, everybody in Windsor was talking about that and everybody in Windsor supported that. And, and, and so I think there's some value in that. But at the same time, I think some very specific priorities as we're going forward and having discussions with the people who, who we need to get on side to, to move this forward. I think we did have a developers uh, conference a few years ago. It might be something to consider, but, but specific discussions to specific properties that might be priorities for us, I think would be very, very helpful. Uh, so, so I think we can do that all concurrently. I think that's called lateral progression as opposed to just linear progression. And, uh, and that's what I'd want to emphasize, that we go forward that way, uh, just to make sure that, uh, uh, that we create that sense of urgency and create the environment that moves these things forward. Regional Councillor. Thanks. Yeah, I, I want to clarify, because I, I was even a little concerned stating it, that, uh, you know, I'm not, I, you never want to be in the position of being seen as somebody saying, I, you know, don't talk to the public. But 
uh, and, and obviously if we're going to do a specific site uh, and that starts to impact the public, you need to have those conversations about what we're looking at. Is anything different? What are the, what, who are the partners? What are the parameters? But I guess what I'm trying to say, at least from my perspective, is we've had a robust discussion with the community not very long ago about uh, a secondary plan, intensification, what would be there, what wouldn't be. And, and unless we're suggesting that we change that and we allow greater, and if we're going to have that, if, if this was a conversation about should we have density, to what degree and where, then yes, <clears throat> you have to have a broad range in public consultation, but that's what we did. This is now simply about enacting it and finding strategic ways to, to get a first step. And I, and I guess I just, I, I know somebody's probably going to twist my words at some point, but I just worried that we're going to spend a lot of time doing things that we've done before, like these broad-ranging consultations and, and engaging the whole community in a discussion about intensification again, and we just had one. Or, you know, uh, and, I, and I think we need to be somewhat urgent about this and, and, and quite focused. And uh, um, do we need to just talk to some of our partners along the way to touch base about the types of incentives? And, or, or, you know, does this sound right? Does this, or if we're doing incentives, if not, what are we doing? But I think we have to be, uh, I, I feel that um, I, I don't want to find us caught up, uh, you know, in a, even laterally in, in a long, prolonged process of getting there. I think it's time to be there. I think we're ready to have some meetings, take some action, look at sites, and get very specific about what or what can be applied there, and who, what partners do we need to be at the table. And, and uh, that, that's that's the nature of my concern. And uh, um, so, anyway, just thought I'd. Start. That's the value of these discussions. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I'll, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn then. Again, uh, I want to thank uh, members of NEDAC uh, for joining us today. And in fact, I think since we do have a site plan meeting this afternoon, we've arranged to have some pizza over at the, at the, uh, on the Mulock room. So I would invite members of uh, NEDAC to join in on some further discussions if we could. I would, I would expect that it would, absolutely. Absolutely, I would think. Okay. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to have their input on Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, one of the reasons for inviting NEDAC, I thought it was a very important meeting that they'd be here to hear from an industry expert. So we've, we've looked at uh, what the priorities of NEDAC are at our first meeting, and this is going to be a very significant part of what we talk about.